Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great to be back here in Winston-Salem. <clears throat> great town, great people, great AA, really. I consider myself very lucky. Um, sometimes when you move from an area that you're, you're real used to your AA and uh, you're kind of worried about uh, how it's going to go in another area, and we lose a lot of people who move. Uh, we lose a lot of the people who retire to a different area, and AA is not the same, and, you know, they just... They go for a while, and then they just kind of lose interest. And uh, there was actually a panel at the uh, uh, at the Akron. Uh, uh, they have a um, – I, I forget what it's actually called, but in Akron, Ohio, uh, they have uh, like a, an event there every year, uh, Founders Day it's called. And they had an old-timers panel, and uh, they asked the old-timers to basically come up with uh, – a topic, and the topic was moving and losing touch with uh, fellowship and program. And it seems like it really is a, a very, very common thing. And I'm incredibly grateful that when I moved, uh, I moved into a hotbed of great AA. And uh, I thank you all for that. Um, it's been a, an absolute pleasure for me to uh, to come down and integrate into this uh, really good AA. All right, tonight we're going to be going over fears, and we're going to be going over uh, uh, the sex inventory and the sex ideal. We're going to be finishing up the chapter, how it works. But I want to sum up just real quickly for anybody that hasn't been here. We talked for weeks about step one. Uh, Why? Because step one is the most misunderstood step uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are people that are here 20 years uh, in AA, they don't understand what step one is because they haven't done a detailed study of the first chapters in the book Alcoholics Anonymous to see what Alcoholics Anonymous considers step one. And to, to make it very, very simple, uh, they see step one as uh, uh, fully conceding to your innermost self that you have the obsession of the mind that leads you back to a drink, even though you really don't want to drink. The allergy of the body that ensures that once you drink, you have little or no control over the amount you take. And also that there's unmanageability in your life. Dash, that your life has become unmanageable. Now, what does that unmanageability look like? It can be external, DUIs, getting thrown out of the house, losing jobs. But mainly what they talk about is the internal unmanageability, the emotional unmanageability that we have. Um, Our inability to... uh, to be consistent with personal relationships, our trouble, you know, that we have with our families, uh, the, the, the depression that we suffer from, uh, the anxiety and self-centered fear that we suffer from, just being uncomfortable with ourselves and our environment. You know, this really is step one. Um, and to fully concede to this, you're basically saying that, you know, I'm powerless, uh, I am powerless. Uh, it's not going to be up to me whether I take a drink uh, of alcohol. It's not going to be up to me whether I survive alcoholism. If you're powerless, you're powerless. Um, that does not mean you're going to go the rest of your life without power. One of the things that these steps are about and that, that Alcoholics Anonymous is about is about getting the power to keep you safe and protected from, from the next drink or the next drug. Uh, to ha- the, getting the power to help you recreate your life. Getting the power to uh, enable you to move away from your grosser handicaps or your defects of character, the things that are blocking you off from God, your fellow man, and an effective life. You know, so in step two, we come to believe that uh, there is a power that we can access, you know, and how we access that is going to be through spiritual living. Uh, in step three, we say, okay, you know, uh, I understand I'm in real trouble with alcoholism. I, I, I've internalized step one. I've come to believe that there's a power greater than myself that I, that I can access, you know, that 
uh, that I can come in contact with who can solve my problems. I, I believe that that's possible. You know, uh, I'm not absolutely sure that it's possible, but I believe that it's possible. And in step three, we make the decision to access that power. Uh, if there is a power that can save my life, uh, that can help me recover from alcoholism, uh, recreate my life, uh, move away from the, the grosser handicaps that are causing my failure at life, you know, yes, I'm in. Uh, tell me what I need to do. And that's basically step three. Uh, in step four, the first thing we're asked to do is inventory uh, the things that have caused our failure at life. The first thing is our anger or our resentment. Resentment really is holding on to anger and allowing it to build a home within us. And, you know, this anger. And I've never met an alcoholic who didn't have this gut-level resentment going on about something. Sometimes we fool ourselves. You know, I have had people sit down with me, uh, and I'm explaining the fourth step, and they'll say to me something like, well, I don't have any resentments. I'm okay with everything. And, you know, that really uh, that really is not true. I'll start asking them, oh, oh so, so you're okay with all the police in your county? You know, they're on your Christmas card list, I would, I would guess. <laughs> no, I, you know, oh, you're okay with all the teachers you had at school. And every one of your family members is absolutely wonderful, right? None of them have any problems. And, uh, and you'll start to be able to pull out of, out of these people their resentments, the things that they've held on to, sometimes for decades. Well, we need to be free of this. We need to be free of this to, to be able to, access the power greater than ourselves that can help us recreate our lives, we need to be free of some of these grosser defects of character, certainly resentment. It says in this book that resentment kills more alcoholics than anything else, and that would have to include alcohol. So we have to take this seriously. We cannot harbor these resentments. We can't do it. Um, every once in a while, I'll see an old timer in AA who really has never done this work, never done the step work, and they've, they've been able to maintain a tentative sobriety for sometimes decades. And they are a cranky lot. You know what I mean? I think we've all met some of them. They are pissed off at anything and everything, at newcomers. Uh, you know, it's I took their parking space, or you're sitting in my seat, you know, or or whatever. And and it, you know, what it says is even if we can survive these resentments, they steal from our quality of life. They rob us of a quality of life. So even if we can survive, even if we can not drink and still have them, you know, it's in our best interest to move away from them because they, they, are, they are ruining our quality of life. That's basically what we went over uh, last week. Uh, column number one, uh, person, place, or institution we are resentful at. Column number two, why we have the resentment. Column number three, the seven areas of self that can be affected. Because um, it's usually money, power, and sex. If our instincts or our ambitions are harmed, threatened, or interfered with, with money, power, or sex, we get, we get angry. Um, instincts would be what is ours and that we're going to protect. Ambitions are the things that we want out there that you're getting in, our way, getting in the way of. You know, move out of the way. I, you know, I want that. So money, power, sex, uh, instincts and ambitions, harm, threatened, or interfered with. We look at this and we start to realize why we have anger and why we have resentment. And through understanding that, we start to get into a position where we can be free of it. There's more work to do, but we have to understand the problem before we can, uh, we can move away from it. Um, Nothing is so damaging to the alcoholic than resentments. Um, I think I shared here last week how resentments almost killed me was I didn't like people when I came into AA. All right, I looked around and I wasn't real pleased with you know the individuals I saw. I, I had a, an acute ability to, to see the defects of character in other people and an almost utter inability to see them in me. 
So I'm sitting in these rooms and I'm listening to somebody share and I'm like, oh God, I can't, you know. And then I started to get into the politics of the meeting, you know, the, the, the hostile, painful, root canal type group consciences and business meetings that they would have, you know, and I, I'd, I'd be like, oh, oh you know, I, and I, what, what happened was I, I was driven out of a home group. I was driven out of a home group by my resentments. Luckily, I, I joined another one, and I was driven out of that home group because of my resentments, and luckily, I joined another one. The only thing that saved my life was joining another home group and trying again, but I have seen so many people resent themselves right out of Alcoholics Anonymous and back to the bottle that, you know, you can't shake a stick without hitting somebody that that has happened to, and that's why it says resentment is the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. Now we're going to move into fear. Um, for anybody with the big book, bottom paragraph on page 67. Uh, notice the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. Let's just turn back a page to the example of the inventory. And there's only three columns here, but this is the, the, the column one, two, and three of a resentment inventory. And if you look, fear is bracketed around, in the third column, fear is bracketed around everything. And it's because you cannot be angry at somebody unless you are afraid they're going to take something away from you that you have or keep you from getting something that you want. So fear is operative in every single resentment. So we need to look at fear. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. Now, I, I want to give you an example out of my own life. Uh, the more recovery work that you do, the more inventory that you write, the more meetings that you go to, the more people that you sponsor, the more you start to understand uh, this process and what it means to you as an individual. Now, I was doing a fear inventory one time, and the person who was taking me through this said, Chris, I want you to do something extra. The big book doesn't say to do this, but I want you to do something extra. Alongside every fear that you list, you have, I want you to give me an example of the first time you felt that fear. And one of the fears was uh, large crowds of people. Now, this was one of my earlier inventories. Uh, you, you never would have gotten me behind a podium, you know, back in my first two or three years. I was way, I had way too much anxiety about that. So I'm, I'm inventorying this, and fear of people was basically the fear. And my first recollection of that fear was when my mother was driving me across town to drop me off for kindergarten. Okay? I'm five years old. I've been hanging around the house a lot, you know, with one woman. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm told that, you know, i got to go do with other people. And, you know, this is okay for some kids. Some kids are like, ooh, ooh kindergarten, you know? Like some like well adjusted people. Well, what happened with me was uh, she took me, drove me across town, uh, opened up the car door, told me to get out. I'm standing on a hill. She closes the door. She takes off, and I'm standing on a hill looking down at the kindergarten building. Okay, and the kids are outside playing kickball and tag. They've already assimilated. They're already all best friends. I can tell from the top of the hill. <laughs> and I'm standing up there feeling like a complete idiot. All right? I'm thinking, you know, what, this, this kindergarten thing, who the hell thought of this? This is, this is a bad idea. You know, I, I don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can walk down this hill. What if those kids make fun of me? What if they don't like me? You know, what if, what if I get into a fight? What, you know, what if I'm ostracized? I mean, that's not exactly how I put it, but that's how I felt. I felt, I felt apart from, I felt less than. You know, I, I had a, an amazing amount of anxiety and self-centered fear. 
But I knew I had to do this thing. I couldn't, like, run away home, you know? Uh, so I sucked it up. I act as if I was cool about this whole thing. And I went down there and I did the kindergarten thing. Now, at that, you know what would have really helped me at that point in time? Be a pint of vodka. <laughs> I would have been able to walk down that hill with confidence. You know what I mean? But the problem was they weren't serving five-year-olds. So I had to go another eight years with that anxiety, going to school, thinking that it was absolutely ridiculous that I had to do this, thinking I was so different than everybody else because I had this anxiety and this fear. And nobody else could have possibly had this because you, I could see that they didn't because of their demeanor. So I felt completely apart from. Now, Fear is an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence is shot through with it. I understand what that means now. I base decisions on how comfortable I was because of how much anxiety or fear I had. I base decisions on whether or not to go to college, whether or not to take certain jobs, whether or not to ask certain women out on dates. It all revolved around a level of comfortability that was in direct proportion to my anxiety and my self-centered fear. So is fear an evil and corroding thread that shoots through your entire life? Absolutely. But we recognize it sometimes as anxiety disorder, or we recognize it as, I just don't feel like doing that. You know, I'm, you know, I'm going to take a pass and pull the covers over my head today, thank you. You know, does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, th this is a damaging emotion. Now, some types of fear, like, like fear of crossing the highway with, you know, semis doing 80 miles an hour, that, that's an appropriate fear. That's an instinct that is, has been put into us for our self-preservation. But what happens with alcoholics is our instincts go awry. We have too much of them, or we have too little of them. We don't have a balanced emotional state, and that's part of the unmanageability of step one. So what do we do? We take a vacation from that stuff with drugs and alcohol, because we just don't feel like feeling uncomfortable all the time. You know, you want me to go out to a party tonight? You know, well, I would get drunk before I went to the party. I, you know, I always needed a little ballast. So I would show up at the party where everybody's getting going to get drunk at, drunk. And that would cause problems, you know. Uh, I would, I, you know, this one time, I was going out on a date. I finally got a date with somebody I was so attracted to. I thought this girl was the coolest girl in the world. But I had to, I had to be cool. I couldn't be, like, shaken in, in fear. So I started drinking, what was it, Miller Malt Liquor in the red cans. Does anybody remember that from the 70s? You drink a six-pack of that, man, and I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> it had, like, wood alcohol in it or something. It was, it was horrible. And I got so drunk, I was in a blackout, I vomited on her, you know? I mean, I mean really. And uh, I did. Now, that was all caused by fear, you know? I had to, I had to get rid of that fear, and I had to use the booze, you know? Um, so... Let's look at what they're, what they're telling us here. Did we not ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. Why would they say that? Why would they say fear should be classed with stealing? Isn't stealing a conscious act? I mean, unless you're like some crazed kleptomaniac. I mean, if you're going to steal something, don't you make a decision to steal it? Well, I think they're saying we're making a decision to have fear. Why? Because we're, rely, we're making a decision to rely on self and not rely on God. That's why we have these fears. Uh, in step three, we make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand Him. If we really mean that, we're placing ourselves in God's protection. He's going to have a care for us care and protection what is he going to let get through to us if we're doing his work well what is he going to let get through to us that's not going to be in our best interest 
So you start to think about this stuff. You start to put yourself on a different plane when you're not operating from self all the time. You're operating through spiritual principles. You start to outgrow fear. So fear should be classed with stealing. Maybe it's because we're choosing in our life to have it. Because we've chosen to take the, take the reins ourselves and run our lives ourselves without any spiritual guidance or help. You know, I went to kindergarten. I, I'm sorry, I went, to, I went to Sunday school. Anybody in here go to Sunday school? They taught us a lot of good stuff. Don't steal. You know, don't lie. You know, share your toys. You know, don't tattletale. You know, all of these, all these things that I chose to, like, ignore. Um, I was being prepared to live a spiritual life. I, I believe I actually chose to go the other direction. You know, I'm running this thing. So, so fear, a lot of times, is our own fault. But it still drives us. If we've allowed it to embed itself in us, it still drives us. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. So column number one is the fear. Column number two is why do you have the fear? And then they ask you a couple of questions, which is all, they're almost always going to be yes. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? You know, you're running your own life. You've been managing your own life. How's that been working for you? You know, that's the great question. Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. Remember, we've made a third step decision. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role He assigns. How do we do that? Well, further on in this book, it gives us exercises, spiritual exercises, that, that puts us in tune with the consciousness of the presence of God. And we start to, we start to be able to access that, that level of intuition, where we know right and we know wrong intuitively. Intuitively means you know without conscious thought. And once we get to that place, they call it sometimes the sixth sense or the fourth dimension in here, once we get to that place, we know what we're supposed to do. We're guided through that intuition toward right and toward wrong. And when we have the power to move in the right direction, we're placing ourselves in, uh, in the place where we believe God would have us. So then we would be playing the role that God assigns. Just to the extent that we do as, uh, as we think he would have us and humbly rely upon him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? So let's look at that sentence really carefully because it's, it's a key sentence in this book. To the extent that we do as we think God would have us. So again, as we develop this, sen this sixth sense, this intuition, we'll more and more be able to understand at a closer level what God would have us would have us uh, do, what he would assign. When we humbly rely upon him, uh, he enables us to match calamity with serenity. Matching calamity with serenity is something that we've not been very good at as alcoholics. We usually met calamity with, with violent anger or a bender. You know, that's the way we, we, would, we would handle it. Um, humbly relying upon God is something that we have to practice. It, it takes a lot of practice. The best possible atmosphere to be in to get to the point where you can humbly rely upon God uh, and do as we think he would have us is to finish these steps. These steps place you in... Um, in the spiritual atmosphere where you can do this stuff. Whereas if we're operating on our own, if we're making all of our own decisions, uh, if we're not seeking guidance, 
uh, if we're not trying to become disciplined about these spiritual exercises, we're pr- we can probably be fooling ourselves as far as our spiritual growth is concerned. And, and you know, nobody's going to punish us for doing this wrong. Alcohol is what punishes us if we do this stuff wrong or if we don't do enough of it or if we're not sincere or if we're not painstaking or if we're not willing to grow along spiritual lines. We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. <laughs> I, I used to, Back in like 1988 or so, well, I would just gotten my license back for like a third DUI, and I'd go out drinking, and uh, I'd be using some cocaine uh, because the cocaine would enable me to stay awake longer. You know, I I usually drank myself into unconsciousness in about four hours, and that was cutting down on my social life. So, uh, so I was using cocaine at, at, as an embellishment to prolong my ability to drink like I wanted to drink, and you know, uh, to some degree, it would work for two or three minutes until I became insane. Uh, But I would be driving home. I would be driving home about 8 in the morning on Sunday. I'd be out all night long, partying all night long, up all night long, you know, with with my buddy's rat and green man, you know. And, And I'd be driving home in my 1976 Ford Granada with busted up quarter panels and, you know, white walls, no muffler, no clutch, you know, no registration, no windshield wipers, no heater, you know, no emergency brake because I was busy and I couldn't couldn't fix it and I'd be I'd be rolling through town with this loud smoking piece of crap and I'd be behind the wheel and I'd drive by a couple you know dressed up real nice for for church and they'd have the two or three little kids with the sailor suits on you know and they'd, they'd be walking off to church and I'd roll down my window and I'd go you losers you know you know you don't know what life is all about and uh, I mean, think about how insane this is. These are probably homeowners, you know. I never knew how you, how do you get a house, you know. I had no idea. These are homeowners. They're probably good jobs. They're raising their children right. You know, they, they, they're affluent, making the right decision. And here's me, you know. I'm, I'm, li- I'm, going, I'm living with mom, you know. I'm driving like a $50 car, and, and I'm calling them losers. <laughs> You know, sometimes we are so far off the mark with our with our perspectives, you know? So paradoxically, spirituality is the way of strength. It really is. You want to be able to do what you want to do? Grow spiritually, and the power will come to you. Usually you're your own worst enemy, because you've got resentment, and you've got fear, and these things are interfering with your ability to do the things you really, really want to do, that, that you know, you really can do, that God gave you the abilities to do. You know, what we do is we shoot ourselves in the foot every five minutes somehow, uh, and, and I didn't believe that when I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I didn't believe it. I thought that by growing spiritually, I was going to become a wimp. You know what I mean? And it's the exact opposite. It really is. It's the exact opposite. Uh, You gain an amazing level of power. Uh, as long as, as long as, you know, you're, you, you have the right motives, uh, and you're really practicing these principles, you get stronger every day. You, you get to be a, a better employer, a better, uh, husband, a better wife, a better, better father, a better mother, a better friend. You're, you're just more consistent. And, uh, and again, I didn't think that when I came in here. I really thought my life was over, uh, I'm going to be in church basements, you know, talking about God the rest of my life. Just shoot me now and get it over with. And it's it's the exact opposite. Uh, The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. I used to think I had courage because I did 
crazy things. I, I raced motorcycles, go-karts, snowmobiles. You know, I, I would do bridge diving, you know, into the Delaware River. I, I would just I would pick on the, the biggest guy at the bar. I, I, I was nuts is what I was. And I, I, I mistook nuts for courage. And uh, I think what courage is, is courage is the ability to walk through the fear, to be able to face that fear and move through it anyway. Because you're trusting and relying upon God. Uh, that really is what courage is. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. Here's a prayer directive. Uh, I'm going to try to highlight all of these prayer directives so that we don't miss them. It's one of the things that we do when we go through these steps. We forget these prayer directives. And they're, I think they're essential. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. So as you're inventorying the fear, fear, why do I have the fear? You answer the redundant questions like, isn't it because self-reliance failed you? And then you do the fear prayer. Okay, God, please remove my, my fear of, you know, my boss and direct my attention to what you would have me be. And at once we commence to outgrow fear. We're, I don't think fear is going to ever disappear completely, but, uh, but we're going to become more courageous about whatever we're afraid of. We're going to grow bigger than the fear. All right, that's fear. Now about sex. Here's another area we totally fouled up. <laughs> I love it. I love it here. It says that we need an overhauling here. Now th think about what it all. You know, a lot. Of, there's a lot of Harley Davidson riders in here. If you're going to overhaul your Harley, what does that mean? That means you strip it right down to to bare metal, right? I mean, the engine off, new, you know, new piston rings, the whole deal. Well, it doesn't say that we need a, a mere tune-up with our sex life. It says we need an overhauling. You know, Bill had us pinned down. Uh, he really, he really knew what. Listen, if we're if we're operating from a place of selfishness and self-centeredness, that's our that's our platform, our operational platform. Of course, we're going to screw up our intimate relationships. You know, we're going to have motives that don't belong in intimate relationships. We're going to have behavior that doesn't belong in intimate relationships. Uh, we just will. Let's see what he has to say about it. Many of us needed an overhauling there. But above all, we try to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off track. Here we find human emo opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices cries that sex is the lust of our lower nature, a base necessity appropriation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. Remember, Freud was, was doing a lot of his theories right about this time. You know, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was, um, was uh, influenced greatly by Carl Jung. Jung believed in God. Freud was basically an atheist. Freud believed that you wanted to kill your father and, and have sex with your mother. I mean, that was like one of his main things. Thank God Alcoholics Anonymous wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't influenced by Freud, and it was influenced by Jung, who believed in God. <laughs> Just a little observation there. Uh, they think that we do not have enough of it, or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fear, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. What is an arbiter? An arbiter is basically a, a judge, someone who, may, who uh, renders a decision. You know, I believe that this is true. I believe that this is true with one exception, and, th and this is not from the big book. This is my own personal, uh, personal exemption to this rule, and that is, I, you know, I've seen predatorial behavior in, in Alcoholics Anonymous for many, many years. Somebody brand new will come in, and before they have a chance to get on their feet, you know, get a sponsor, start working the steps, somebody, you know, wants to come up and be Mr. Good Daddy to them or, you know, or something, you know what I'm saying, and, and I hustle them off into a sexual relationship. Uh, that, can, that can be a killing thing. And so, so I'm, I'm not real happy when, when I see that go on. But as far as what type of sex and, you know, uh, it, that, 
what he's basically saying is, is that, you know, this is between us and God. The type of uh, the, the, the type of uh, sex ideal we come up with really is between us and God. And what we do, you know, with consenting adults, uh, you know, as long as the, as long as we follow some of these principles, which are about you know uh, keeping the levels of harm uh, as slight as possible. Uh, it really shouldn't, you know, we really shouldn't, as Alcoholics Anonymous members, go around, you know, uh, and, and be telling everybody what, what their sex life should look like. Uh, we all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? All right, here's the inventory for sex harms. We review our own conduct over the years past. What I like to do is take one piece of paper for each, uh, each relationship that meets this criteria. So, Review the relationship. I'll write a paragraph on, you know, where I met this person, you know, how long I was with them, what, a little bit about what happened. You know, just a little review of the relationship. So when I'm doing a, a fifth step with somebody, I can, I can paint the picture a little bit of, about what, what happened. Then it asks us three wheres. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? Okay, note this it doesn't say were we. It says, where were we? Because if we're, if we're an alcoholic and we were in a relationship, it's a given that we were selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. We need to list out where where we were. I don't like the inventories where there's a check mark. Uh, I make my guys uh, write at least a sentence on where they were uh, selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate. Whom had we hurt? Now, obviously, the person we're inventorying, but there may be collateral damage. Uh, you know, there may be a husband or a wife that was affected on our side. There may be a husband or a wife affected on the other side. There may be children or families or mothers and fathers who got hurt. There can be all kinds of collateral damage. This is a question where we, we fill out the other people uh, who we may have hurt uh, as well. Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Um, we can do this because we manipulate. We use our affections or our, or, our, uh, uh, or, or our offering of sex sometimes as uh, manipulators or to, or, to, or to punish, we'll pull it back. You know, there, there, there's a lot of ways we use uh, sex in a wrong way. So we need to, we need to answer this. Um, you know, did we uh, arouse jealousy, suspicion, or betterness? You know, uh, I'm, I'm almost always guilty of this, even if it's at a very subtle level. You know, I, the levels were extreme when I was out there drinking, but now that uh, I'm in recovery, I'm certainly not a perfect person. So these things can be a little bit below the horizon. They can be hard to pick up on. Uh, but I, I need to be honest and I need to be searching and fearless and try to see where am I uh, arousing jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness. Where were we at fault? What what should we have done instead? Not what could we have done instead. What should we have done instead? We probably couldn't have done any better because we were driven by a hundred forms of fear and resentment and our whole life system was based on a foundation of selfishness and self-centeredness. We probably did the best we could. But it says here, what should we, what should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. So again, one piece of paper for every single uh, every single instance that I need to inventory, and answer all these questions. And I like to do it in sentence form. In this way, we try to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. So after you've done all of your inventories, you now know what doesn't work. I mean, if, you know, you're going to have example after example after example of defective intimate relationship uh, uh, behavior. You know what doesn't work. So it's now asking you to sh shape a sane and sound ideal for future sex life. And what that means is you need to, you need to develop the attributes that you would like to bring in to the next party. How would you like to be showing up at the next party? What would you like to bring into the next relationship? Because it's a given you attract what you are. So if you're very healthy, you're going to attract the same type of thing in a partner. 
Or you can, or you'll develop it. Let's let's say you're you've been married an alcoholic, and you start to develop this this uh, this sex ideal, and you start to ask God to help mold you and direct you into it. A lot of times, the rest of the family uh, or your wife or husband start to get better because you're getting better. So this is this is very very important uh, that uh, that you do this. We sub- we subjected each relationship to this test. Was it selfish or not? Here's another prayer directive. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. So again, for at least a while, what you want to do is in your in your morning prayer uh, and, and evening review, you need to look at this. You need to ask for the power to mold your ideals into what you would like to be, how you would like to be showing up. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loved. I believe that God gave us um, instincts in this department, uh, and I believe two things about that. One of them is I believe we have it so that there's a continuation of the human race, so we have a sex drive, and it's instinctual. And he also made it fun so that we would do it. So think about this. God made sex fun and wants you to do it. Okay? And that's true. It's just he doesn't want, I don't think God wants us to use it in the wrong way where it will cause harm. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. Here's another, uh, this is actually a meditation directive. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. So after you've got this inventory done, you're going to have to be thinking about whether there's possible amends that need to be made. We're supposed to ask God in meditation about how we should handle these amends or the change in behavior if we're still, you know, with somebody. Um, Remember, meditation, as far as Bill Wilson was concerned, was deep, concentrated thought. It wasn't the type of meditation that you see Kung Fu doing, you know, emptying his mind in a lotus position with the incense burning. That's not how they meditated back then. What they did is they concentrated on specific subjects, and they went into a deep, uh, 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 guided, meditative state where where it was really contemplation more than it was meditation. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with, with other persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. That is, we let our intuitive self be the final judge. Is this right or is this wrong? We need to be true to ourselves. And answer this, you know, very honestly, because we could be in big trouble if we continue to be selfish. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. All right. We are not perfect. Uh, Bill Wilson was a great example of not being perfect with uh, with his sex drive. Okay. And, uh, and uh, uh, I don't think any of us can claim to be perfectly pure as the driven snow in this area. So so this is this is important. We need to look at we need to look at this because this is a warning. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. So, suppose if we step out on the missus uh, or, or 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 the old man. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but this is only a half truth. It depends upon us and on our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. So this is the operative, this is the operative thing. I have seen people in Alcoholics Anonymous absolutely refuse to subject their self, their their sex life to spiritual principles. It was nobody's business, and they were gonna they were gonna have they were gonna have relations with whoever the hell they wanted to, and and you better stay out of their way while they're doing it. And every single case where those people were alcoholic, they got drunk, and many of them died. 
You know, so when there's a warning in this book, we need to pay attention to it because it, it really does happen. These guys knew what they were talking about. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. Now, the people that are predators that last in AA, you know, year after year, they're, they're doing the same shit. They're not alcoholic. Okay, what they're what they're doing is they're here for other motives. Because if they were alcoholic, they would be drunk. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, here's another prayer directive. We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. Two people, two of my closest and dearest friends, in the last two weeks, had their husbands come to them and say, I've been seeing somebody, I'm separating, I'm looking for a divorce. Two of my closest friends for ten years, they've been married to the same, same, same guys and they, they looked like they had the perfect relationship, you know, the perfect AA relationship. Two of them. Now, both of them, you know what they did because they were good AA members? They, they went, they headed straight for their sponsees. They headed straight for the beginner's meetings. They started doing 12-step work like crazy because they understood that that is the way to get out of the horrible emotions that come from defective uh, intimate relationships. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we've written down a lot. We've listed and analyzed our resentments. We've begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality, how they can kill us, and how futile it is to have them. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look upon them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith for us, uh, that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has brought, blocked you off from Him. If you have already made a decision, the third step, and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, what we just covered in the last two weeks, step four, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. And we need to do that. We need to... We need to see what the truth is about uh, about us. And we've only made a beginning. Um, I've seen a lot of people get up to step four and then do a fifth step and really, really stop there. Really stop there. I know up in my area uh, there was a real lack of attention to detail when it came to steps eight and nine. Ten and eleven. And twelve. Um, I think we only, always must remember that... Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed the path. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're looking in a very detailed fashion uh, in, these work, in, this, in this workshop here uh, about what following the path is. What does it look like? How do you do it? And, uh, you know, I can't tell you how much my life has changed because of multiple fourth and fifth steps, multiple eight and ninth steps, uh, and working with other people. Um, I was pathetic in the late 80s. Uh, I was pathetic. As, and my, my alcoholism was so bad. It, you know, I, my world was so small because of my alcoholism and the way I behaved. Um, all I can tell you is from my own personal experience, uh, adherence to these principles, to, to whatever ability you know I, I've been capable, has led to incredible things in my life. And uh, um, I want to thank everybody for, for listening tonight. And next week we're going to move into step five.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.